I am Ellie Gross. I'm the Managing Director for the Economic and Monetary Policy Institute at OMFIF. And once again, so grateful for you all to be joining us. Uh, also, uh, those who are listening online, very pleased that you can be taking part in this discussion. Everything will be recorded, as uh, we said at the start, so we're very pleased to have everybody here. I am a big believer in audience interaction. So once my panelists have answered the questions that I have, I will be uh, asking you all to, to kind of pop your, pop your name cards on the side and, uh, and also ask your questions too. So do be thinking about those throughout as well. We have Christopher Neely here, who's Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I'm very pleased to be able to ask you around the Fed's dual mandate, looking at how we are combating, how you and also the Fed and the wider central banking community is combating inflation. And then also we'll dive into a little bit about, you've written a bit about the, the unconventional monetary policy that we've seen over the last few years. So we'll be a little bit also in how that plays into what we're now seeing with QT. Uh, James Sweeney, Head of Economics at uh, BlackRock. Excellent to have you here too. Thank you so much. I'll ask about the market views of the Fed's toolkit. And actually a question that came up in the last session I'm going to ask around, do we have the right models? Are we on the right track? Are we, are we looking at the right things? And then that brings me excellently onto Isabella Weber, who is Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts. I'm really pleased that you'll be able to give a little wider. I think you said earlier that you were sort of out of the box, and I like that. We can uh, shake things up a little bit. That's looking around the overlapping emergencies that we are currently seeing. So that is uh, enough of my voice, and I will go to you, Chris. Please could you give a little bit of a flavor on the interpretation of the dual mandate for the Fed, its implications, we were talking around the, the, the title of this is revising the monetary policy toolkit. Do we need to be doing that? What is your kind of thoughts around how central banks are tackling the current, current issues? Okay, so uh, the disclaimer, as everyone who works at the Fed here knows, uh, definitely applies to me. Um, so what about the, the dual mandate? I guess I should say first that, you know, the dual mandate is one step above what any decision that anyone at the Fed makes. So the Fed is a creature of Congress. Uh, Congress decides on the dual mandate or whatever mandate they're going to give us, and then we try to uh, fulfill the mandate as best we can. Uh, with respect to the dual mandate, so, since you know, since I can't uh, – since I can't comment directly on the dual mandate, what I could do though is talk a little bit from an academic point of view about mandates in similar countries and what we might learn about mandates from those. So I knew that uh, Ellie was going to ask me about mandates and frameworks. I, I don't want to I don't want to mislead you into thinking that I uh, did this uh, that I know this stuff off the top of my head. I did a little bit of research into the G10 mandates, and I, I looked them all up. And first, I found that there are only seven G10 mandates, as some of you have already figured out, uh, because there several countries are under the ECB. So the G10 mandates all include a uh, mention of price stability or something very similar. And uh, many of them, most of them include something about uh, that sort of qualifies the, the uh, mandate to obtain price stability and qualifies it in terms of uh, being careful about the economic context in which price stability is achieved. And that's usually interpreted as uh, perhaps a weak version of the maximum employment mandate. So. An exception to that, however, is the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada's mandate, at least so far as I could see, doesn't say anything about real activity or a qualifier to that effect. Now, I could be mistaken. This was pretty cursory research. But I also found out that the Bank of Canada and the Canadian government did a review of their framework in 2021, and they looked at four options for 
the Bank of Canada's mandate. And one of the options was essentially a dual mandate along the lines of the Fed. And that was rejected in, in comparison to keeping their, their current mandate, which just, uh, just means price stability. But I will say that although the rest of the G10 doesn't have a dual mandate in the same way that the Fed does, I do notice that central banks, uh, all the economists and usually uh, often the governors at central banks, they go to the same schools, they read the same papers, they get the same ideas to a large extent. They're hit by similar international shocks and not surprisingly, central banks internationally behave similarly. And although I can't prove this and I haven't done any research on it, my guess is it would be very difficult to distinguish the behavior of banks without a dual mandate or with some kind of weaker version of a dual mandate from the behavior of banks with no dual mandate at all, like the Bank of Canada, or banks with a dual mandate like the Federal Reserve. Thank you very much. And I guess that actually brings us very nicely onto James. So looking from the perspective from the market, do you think that the, the Fed's dual mandate is the, the correct structure? And also a little bit on the, do, do we have the right models as well within the toolkit to be addressing those, that mandate effectively? Thank you. Um, dual mandate is fine, I think, from a big picture perspective, I, to me it makes sense um, to, to target inflation and to have a labor market component. Um, I, I, I think it's all in the implementation details and uh, you know what will the Fed do? We're in a moment right now where there's considerable uncertainty in the market about what the Fed will do. Um, there's not considerable uncertainty about the mandate. It's about how to achieve the mandate. Um, you know, we, we heard earlier um, that not much has changed since before the pandemic. Um, to me, a lot has changed um, in, in monetary policy. One thing that's changed is um, we don't hear a lot of central bankers say that deflation is a bigger risk than inflation anymore, which was very often said before 2020 for many years. Um, the reason for that was, I think, fear of the, the, the zero bound um, and, and just discomfort in use of, of balance sheet policies. Um, and it was often said, a belief that we know how to conquer inflation when it breaks out. It's, it's somewhat obvious. Um, you can raise interest rates and slow the economy. Um, but to me, it, it was always somewhat obvious that history suggests accomplishing that presents political economy challenges that are harder than they look always. Um, and so inflation is more frequent than deflation historically and even cross-sectionally at almost every moment in time. So, so here we are, and the Fed are not targeting two, they're targeting around two, we, we heard today. Um, so, so things are pretty interesting. Um, and on those models, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I, I'm not sure a version of the models that says it's all about labor market slack and core services inflation X housing um, is a model that we trust in, in terms of um, getting inflation back to target and, and, and following the employment mandate. Um, you know, there was just a paper by Bernanke and, and Blanchard last week suggesting that, um, that maybe labor market slack has not had that big a role in the inflation problem so far during the pandemic, but it's likely to have an increasing role going forward. Like this is actually a controversial idea that the slack has been central because we had low slack in 2019 and, and not much inflation. So again, some things have changed. Um, I think the institutions in, in financial markets have changed. There are many businesses who believed the kind of really low R star deflation is a bigger risk than inflation story told by many economists and central banks before 2020 and have built their business models around that view. And now they're getting in trouble 
and that's what's happened to some banks in the US. And if interest rates remain here or higher, it's likely that it will happen to more banks and to more institutions going forward. And, and you know, whether the Fed can be patient with those problems and their ability to help inflation back to 2% or else they need to do a little more is a pretty major uncertainty that no model is gonna resolve um, at this point. So just to kind of close my opening remarks, I, I, I think a lot has changed. Um, I think models are good for giving someone a general sense of how monetary policy works, but not so good for answering important questions about what is next from, from the moment right now. And, and I think the big thing that's changed is the fear of deflation is less and the institutions are a little different and some balance sheets are a little more fragile than they seemed not that long ago. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use my uh, discretion as chair to actually ask you immediately a follow-up question. Um, and this is one that has come when I was having conversations yesterday uh, through New York with David Marsh as well. Um, should we be, and is there any scope? So as President Harker mentioned earlier, that they're looking for kind of the range of 2% inflation, even if that's likely above. And one of the questions that kind of came out of that is, do we accept and what are the implications of us accepting that actually 3% might be the correct inflationary um, level? Do you buy into that? And what is your thinking around if actually there is a, okay, we need to take stock, we need to work out actually is 2% the correct um, target for inflation in our, in our current demographics and our current structures in the current world that we are living in? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a big difference between outcome and target. And I, I think changing the target from two to three or something like that would, would have significant implications in private sector expectations. Um, and I, I think that would probably have some negative consequences. Um, I think it may well be that you end up with 3% inflation for several more years, at least from here in, in certain states of the world. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a growing conversation in the market about you know, the potential disinflationary impacts of new technologies like ChatGPT. So, um, so I, I, I think um, messing with the target is just going to create uncertainty, um, and and I, I think it would um, erode some of the confidence in the Fed um, if if that happened. Um, but I but I think you know you can have a theme of patient return to two percent, which is not quite the same as as changing your goalpost. Thank you, and this. Brings us nicely on to you, Isabella. Be interesting to hear your perspectives around actually uh, the the uh, the times we're living in is overlapping emergencies, and our central banks set up, and also should they be uh, alone in managing these challenges, and how do we build out this conversation to perhaps also looking at beyond central banks as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the way that I'm thinking about this current moment is indeed in terms of overlapping emergencies. We have had the pandemic, we have the war in Ukraine that kind of overlapped with the pandemic. And of course we have climate change where many climate scientists have been warning of um, tipping points happening much earlier than we might have thought. And these things have consequences and they have consequences that tend to be very sectoral. So if we look at climate change and we look at things like the Mississippi River, drying up, then this has a very immediate sectoral impact. Or if you look at Germany where rivers have been drying up um, and coal couldn't be shipped and that um, at least at the margin exacerbated um, the energy crisis. So if this is a situation where these kind of shocks have become more likely, we of course never know whether they are gonna hit and when they're gonna hit and how they're gonna hit, but it seems like they have become somewhat more likely than they used to, used to be in the era of the great moderation. And if I look at um, papers like the Bernanke Blanchard paper that has already been mentioned, that suggests among other things that price shocks were actually the most important, one of the most important drivers um, of inflation. Then I think this begs the question of what kind of price shocks have the potential to become systemically important? Or in other words, what kind of prices are systemically significant for inflation overall? And this is a question that we have been trying to address in recent research using input output modeling where we basically shock every sector at a time and try to see what are the impacts on the general price level um, looking at these indirect effects that come from our um, input output model as well as of course the direct effect that comes simply from the weight of the CPI. 
And we see that a small handful of sectors end up being considerably more important than all other sectors, in particular, energy, energy intensive sectors such as um, chemicals, but also the bare necessities that um, President Har Harker was, um, sorry, President Carter was um, talking about earlier um, today, that is housing, food, and so on. So if this is the case, if there are specific sectors that have the potential to unleash overall monetary stability, then maybe we have to think about complementary tools where we can um, absorb shocks in these sectors more locally. And I think that the mobilization of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in 2022 is, an, is a successful example of that. And if we had a mindset of doing this more systematically, then maybe the Strategic Petroleum Reserve would have been mobilized in a way where oil would have been bought up when prices were negative, would then have been released when oil prices started to climb, um, and thereby also sending strong signals to the market. So basically a form of open market operation um, for the oil sector as something that can be complementary to monetary policy and that can halt these kind of energy shocks um, before they ripple through the whole economy. Thank you very much. James, I'm gonna bring it back, um, back to you and actually ask you around the, the effectiveness of, of forward guidance. And do we think that kind of building on that models question, and we'll go back to some of this, especially as we are in a, in a time of a lot of volatility, as Isabella mentioned, we're coming into a climate crisis as well. And there are huge amounts that the, the policymakers have to consider, and also this high inflationary environment that comes from various different uh, spaces and geopolitics plays into this as well. Kind of my question is, is actually, if we're looking at, Central bank saying we're looking at the data. We're going to be really data focused every time we, we we go into these meetings and look at our rate hikes. Rather than forward guidance, we're looking at the data and we'll, we'll come to those conclusions each time. Do we have the correct data? It goes back to a little bit. Do we have the correct models? But also, do we have the correct data? Are we comfortable that this is this is a, an area that we can can keep on living in? And how how do we how do we go forward? Well, I, I would just start by saying I, I don't think um, forward guidance is an alternative to looking at the data. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I, don't, I know that was not what you're suggesting, but I, I think um, the forward guidance has, has its uses, right? And um, communicating to the market a likely path of policy is, is a way to guide the yield curve, which is useful for, for a policy perspective, whether you have great data or not, right? If, if the market believes it, so it's all about the credibility. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, we have a lot of data, right? I, I, I think the, the US labor market is extraordinarily well covered by, uh, by the data sets that exist. Um, it's just hard to predict what's gonna happen next. It's not that hard to tell what's happening in a, in a moment in time and notwithstanding, what was it, the quarterly, um, labor market survey that came out a week or two ago that suggested that we had a contraction in jobs last year for, for a bunch of months. But, um, but I, I think, um, yeah, I, to me, these, these, are, these are two separate questions. I, you know, I, I think forward guidance is useful as long as they're credible. I, I think we have plenty of data. Um, the problem is the models and, and the natural uncertainty that exists given, given that data. Um, I don't think either of these things resolve the challenges that the Fed has in, 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 in front of them. Um, I, I think it's, on top of all, it's really important to look at the institutions of the financial system and, and how, it's, how it's shifting. I, I think the balance sheet right now is something that's getting not enough attention um, in, in regards to monetary policy. Um, we've had some, uh, you know, statements about what, when is QT going to change? You know, the, the, I think the Fed has a clear desire um, to for interest rates to be the main tool, um, not the balance sheet. Um, and yet it would be pretty strange if, if they continued to do QT and started to cut. Um, when you have conversations about when could QT end, they do some weird things about looking at, you know, reserves or reserves plus RRP as a share of nominal GDP relative to you know certain events in, in money markets in, in recent years which um, which may not be especially relevant going going forward so so to me there are just many sources of uncertainties about how the institutions are changing 
about how to interpret current data and, and the underlying parameterization in the economy and, and the correct models. Um, and, and the Fed has to, you know, continue to kind of pursue its 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 mandate given all this uncertainty. And, and that is a great task. It, it's best pursued with with honesty about these uncertainties and not kind of you know simplifying some of the relationships. Thank you. Christopher, moving a little bit on to actually where we've come from. So a few years ago, uh, St. Louis very kindly hosted a conference that Ompis put together looking at QE. It was something that was still being discussed. The consequences of QE were still unknown. We were in the middle of it. Um, and now we've shifted to QT um, and uh, all, all the other acronyms that go along with that. And I think that we're still living in the consequences of, of QE and having um, so much flow into, into central banks' balance sheets. So it'd be interesting to have a little bit of that conversation around uh, the implications following years of unconventional monetary policy uh, and a little bit in, uh, in which, which assets have, have been potentially uh, um, been made um, uh, unreflective of unreflective or difference or, or, or created a difference within them? So I'm not, I'm not sure that I know of any assets that, that whose prices would no longer be reflective of their underlying value because of, because uh, of uh, QE or, or QT. Um, presumably if the Fed went in and, and bought up enough of some particular class of assets, then that could create a condition in which it simply wasn't sufficiently traded to be to be functionally liquid in the market anymore. But I I don't know that of any type time that that's happened. Yeah. Do you uh, do you think that that the 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 knowledge like that we know the consequence of QE currently? As in, do we have do do we know? Are we still living in? Are we still living in a world? where we are seeing the effects of QE play out? So th there's been a, a huge amount of research on QE and the uh, accompanying uh, policy tools uh, for guidance and, and tools that the United States hasn't used, but other, other central banks have, such as negative interest rates. And uh, there's been quite a lot of research on these tools. And I think that the short and simple story is that in the aftermath of the, of the great financial crisis, these tools did work fairly effectively to provide substantial monetary stimulus. Um, but we should also know that um, we should keep in mind that when we talk about monetary policy tools or economic policy tools in general, usually it's not a matter of they work or they don't work. It's a matter of in this particular situation, in this circumstance, the way they were used, the way they were communicated, they did what they were supposed to do or not. So for example, in the case of forward guidance, there's forward guidance can be, uh, you know, one of several kinds, right? It can be, can be Delphic, which means that uh, the Fed is essentially making a prediction about the future. It can be Odyssean, which means that the Fed is, or any central bank is committing itself to some course of action. Um, and then there are various kinds of forward guidance too. So, you know, I think forward guidance did work effectively to coordinate expectations on lower interest rates in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, but really only sometimes. It depended how it was done. Thank you. That's a very good color there. Isabella, going back to you and looking at, again, how central banks have taken on this, um, this, this huge how central banks have taken on the, the overlapping emergencies that we were talking about. And um, you mentioned earlier, so this might be a little bit of a, a, um, a side question, looking at the energy crisis. So you've been looking at the energy crisis as well. And so if you could give some color on where you think the next risk will come from and will it come from us coming through the energy crisis? Yeah, um, maybe on the energy crisis, actually it was serving um, the German government in the fall working on gas price stabilization there where there was a situation where there was a hope that the general macroeconomic environment, monetary policy and so on 
would be enough to contain that energy price shock. And then this was, of course, the most extreme of the extreme situations. But came September, um, we were in a situation where it was simply no longer feasible um, for the economy to absorb the kind of gas price shock that we were that we were facing. So Germany being, of course, an import dependent country, um, unlike the US um, in, in the fossil fuel sector, the only tool that we had at hand really was a non-linear pricing scheme that has been financed um, fiscally where um, you have one share of consumption for households and firms that is price stabilized. And then you have another share at the margin of 20% um, for households, 30% um, for firms where it's not price stabilized so that you maintain the price signal where it can operate at the margin, but you do not shock households and firms in the part of consumption where they simply cannot adjust um, by having kind of a fiscal buffer to that um, kind of price shock. Now, this was of course a total extreme emergency that Germany was in, but I think these kind of policies can be helpful in these really extreme kind of emergencies. Now, looking forward, I think that, um, I mean, if I take the IEA um, warning about um, uh, uh, gas prices seriously, I think that the, there is a chance that ga gas prices will be um, unstable again. So I think especially in the energy sector, we are, I mean, of course, in a much better place, but I don't think we are out of the thick of it. If we are serious about a green transition, it's also the case that um, there will be volatility in that transition, I think. Um, when um, there are there is a peak demand and you suddenly need fossil fuels, um, where fossil fuel supply has um, been starkly reduced, then that could also result in, uh, in price spikes. I also think looking at um, global grain markets, um, looking at what is happening with grain in Ukraine, um, we see that the um, planting of grain has quite drastically um, been reduced. Um, I've been talking to people in, in the grain trading business who are saying they're basically one extreme weather event away from another grain price shock. Now, um, grain price shocks are, of course, very problematic for food inflation, and food inflation is something that we have already been grappling with. And if in the US and countries um, like um, those in the European Union are really struggling with food price inflation, then um, countries in the global south are <laughs> um, in, in real trouble, right? Um, so I think that for the whole question of grain markets, which again is one that is heavily interacting with climate change, um, new forms of global stabilization are important. I'm not saying I have the solution. I think it's very complicated to come up with uh, measures of stabilization because they have to take the realities of these markets into account. Of course, what we would be doing for grain would be different than what we would be doing for oil or for gas. Um, but I think we have to start thinking about expanding the toolbox for these most essential goods um, to take out some of the volatility that um, we might be faced with. Thank you very much. I want to move on to any one around the table. I did say that I would be coming to you. So does anybody have a question or want to pick up on any of the discussion points or even a perspective themselves? I think that we are all here and we all have a lot to contribute to these discussions around where we think the, the monetary policy toolkit should sit and, and where we what we are looking at inflation. So also please do use this opportunity to kind of bring the perspective that you have as well. Um, I'm keen on that. Uh, so George. Yeah, I, I'm George O'Gay from Chesham Investments in Boston. Uh, following the global financial crisis, there was some discussion as to whether the Fed should add a financial stability target to its mandate. And since that time, of course, we've had uh, SVB and some other prominent bank failures. Uh, so I guess my question for the panelists is, what do you think of that notion, bearing in mind that the lean versus clean debate is one of the perennial uh, debates in, in central banking? How should we think about the asset prices and financial stability in the context of the central bank mandate? James, you want to take? Sure. Well, I mean, supervision is part of the Fed's role. And I mean, sometimes it's not good enough in, in certain circumstances. But, um, but I, you know, that's not part of the mandate, but that's part of the role of, of, the, of the Fed. Um, I'm not sure the mandate needs to be redefined to include that. Um, I, I will say one thing that a lot of people, a lot of investors are, are talking about now is 
is our star star. It was bad enough that we had to talk about our star. Now we're talking about our star version two that gives us financial stability, um, and that's different. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty painful that that discussion. And um, if you know, if, if financial stability it, or instability gets sufficiently severe, surely that's going to impact inflation. Um, you know, the, the financial system itself is is always evolving and changing uh, in response to regulation and technology and natural growth, and and I I think I think everything um, that happens in, in the is is in in the economy is, is in some ways touched by how the financial system is functioning and how it's functioning is different every 15 or or, or 20 years. Um, to me, the, the Fed and, and other official institutions simply need to keep some focus on those changes, understand those risks, and, and fulfill their, their supervisory mandate as well as their ordinary monetary policy role. Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so, you know, as, as you know, the classic debate in this, these circles is, do you use macro prudential tools, which may not be powerful enough to get into every crack and crevice of the financial system, and which may not quite do the job if you've got an emerging vulnerability, or do you use monetary policy, which is sort of a blunt broadsword, and which also, you know, if you're using monetary policy for financial stability, you're giving something up with respect to GDP and inflation. That's the that's the classic debate, right? And uh, you know, it seems to me the 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 usual answer back before the great financial crisis was no monetary policy sticks to monetary policy goals and financial stability does as best it can with regulations and macro prudential tools it seems to me that the the probably if monetary policy can have an effect on financial stability and it probably can then the optimal response probably isn't zero uh, you know, you'd have to think about what it is, but probably zero isn't the right answer. Isabella, do you have any thoughts on central banks and well between monetary policy and financial stability? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess the trade-off that has just been pointed to is a real one that we have been in some sense experiencing again in the last um, months in terms of um, the anxiety around the stability of the banking sector, which I think again, kind of back to the question, if it is true that shocks have become more likely in the most systemic or significant areas, um, and you have such shocks and such shocks unleash inflation, you're in an environment where you have already pretty high interest rates and where you might have already a destabilized banking sector because you have been going through the kind of anxiety that we have been going through recently, then how do you respond to such shocks? And doesn't wouldn't it be a case where these trade-offs are becoming um, even more um, challenging than they might have been starting from a very, very low level of interest rates. Thank you. David. Yes, I had a couple of uh, questions. Um, one on this question, uh, James, where you said um, one shouldn't change the target. I, I agree with you. It seems to be this sufficient flexibility already, uh, or you might say sufficient mud in the way that one defines various things in the central bank set of equations. So why bring in another precise variation um, to try to take account of the new set of circumstances? And, and I just wondered whether the panel believes that, say, the inflation targeting regime, which was brought in in August uh, three years ago, this is a question for you, Chris, and I brought this up briefly with you before the session started, whether that actually encompasses the new situation, because it was never made quite clear when that averaging was starting and you could start the if you started the averaging in about 2013 uh, you could easily encompass a period of above average inflation in the next two or three years so i just wondered whether the panelists could comment on that and then the second question regards qe and i was wondering whether in the united states there's some feeling that people have departed from the labor force uh, people particularly elderly people who are maybe sitting on assets which have gone up a great deal in value, people who had been in the labor force might then feel encouraged to leave the labor force because they feel they can rest now on a cushion of higher savings, thanks to higher equity 
prices or indeed uh, houses that have gone up in value. We seem to see some indication of that in the United Kingdom, um, elderly people leaving the labor force, partly because of QE. And I wondered whether you could see anything like that in America. Thank you. Chris, do you want to take one or both or? Sure, how about I, if I do the first question. So it, just to restate David's question, David pointed out that from say 2012 to 2020, the Fed was consistently below its uh, PCE inflation target. It averaged about 1.4%, if I remember correctly. And then in 2020, it adopted the flexible average inflation targeting framework, which said essentially if inflation is below the target, then we will allow inflation to run above the target for some time to make up for that. So I understand your point. They didn't put it, they didn't put any numbers on that. Um, I'm not sure that when they adopted the framework that they meant that they were referring to past inflation, but even if they were, my guess is that this is well above what they were thinking about. I, I think, I suspect they're probably thinking about inflation in the neighborhood of 3% rather than, you know, getting up to 7%. Thank you, James. Yeah, um, well, I, I think, you know, the, one of the problems with, with average inflation targeting is it's sort of one of these policies that was constructed as if history started around 1993, 1994. Because if, if you go further back, you look at major wars and major shocks, you know, there is such thing as, as like a war or a big shock that gives a price level shock where you have temporary inflation. You never go back to your old kind of price level trend, but you do get back to, to normal inflation. And the pandemic in many ways looks a lot like kind of World War I, World War II, the, those shocks where you had a jump in the, a temporary jump in the price level and then a, and then a path of, of, of normalization. Um, you know, we haven't normalized back to 2% inflation yet, um, but, you know, if, if you jump to a 3% inflation target, you know, if, if that's coming from two, you get the benefit of a short-term boom in nominal growth. If you're already above 3% inflation, going to a 3% inflation target doesn't give you that transition benefit to the higher target. All it does is usher in a higher interest rate structure. Um, so I, I, that's, that's one of the reasons I don't like it. Just, just on the on the second question on, on the labor, I was just looking at this. So I'll, I'll, um, if, if you look at um, labor force participation um, by kind of five-year age bucket in, in the U.S., it's now really over 70 where you've had, um, where, where you have a problem in, in participation. Every, all the other cohorts are kind of reasonably close to pre-pandemic. Uh, participation rates, but but the issue is the share of the over 55s who are over 70 is rising really sharply, and the particip participation rates of all old people were rising very sharply before the pandemic, and now they're sort of sideways rather than rising sharply. So it, it is it is a worsening of the labor supply situation relative to what your expectations would have been before 2019, but there are some nuances to it which are which are really interesting. Thank you. Isabel, do you have any perception on that labor force participation as well? But also it'd be interesting kind of looking wider than that. And also, do you see any demographic changes as well? Well, I mean, I would just add that obviously we, as far as I can see, we don't have a very good picture yet what the effects of long COVID are and what part of the labor market issues that we are facing are also related to, that, to the fact that we have been living through a global pandemic. And when we talk about the stimulus where some part of the stimulus also basically enabled people to maybe not go to work at a time when it was very dangerous to catch COVID um, in an unvaccinated um, situation, then I think we kind of also have to discount for that effect that might have been a positive um, on the labor market by not adding more labor market tightening than we could have had if people have had to um, go to work because they could not stay at home because they were supported um, during the worst period of the pandemic. So what I'm arguing is that I think on the labor market front, um, there is a nuance to be added to the question of the size of the stimulus. Thank you. I also think it was interesting that President Harker brought up twice the childcare inflation as well, and uh, and actually that being a part of the labor force participation as well is definitely a piece of the puzzle, which is an interesting exploration there as well. 
Yeah, and actually, I mean, we have seen that if you plot the um, childcare expense um, inflation, that this has been a buff trend for a long time, right? So this means that there has been a structural trend of childcare expenses going up and therefore, th therefore really um, exerting um, pressure on the labor market. I think this is something that, again, is not an issue for monetary um, policy, but something that could be tackled with non-monetary policy and would actually be anti-inflationary. And just to keep on kind of within that as well, looking at actually, do you think that that will have a larger demographic shift that, that actually underlines the, the inflationary pressures? So it makes inflation less transitory, not actually separate from supply and demand or how, we, how we're used to looking at inflationary frameworks, actually, if there is a, dem if there is a demographic pressure and with an older population, especially, and, and how do you think that that will look for, for the future? I mean, there is, of course, a demographic pressure, but I think the question is how will it play out? I mean, it interacts with all these other things that we have already been talking about, right? It, in, it interacts with migration, it interacts with AI, it inter interacts also, I think, with um, how the global production network will be looking like. If we talk about onshoring and reshoring and French shoring and so on, then this could be interacting with demographic pre pressure in uh, a quite extraordinary kind of way. So I think we have to see the demographic changes in relationship to all these other trends and rather than seeing them uh, separately as one given structural variable that will inevitably lead to inflation. What I'm hearing quite a lot today is that AI seems to be the silver bullet. So good job we're talking about that tomorrow and looking at technology because it seems to be that that's uh, that's gonna that's gonna solve the inflationary problem. Um, so looking forward to that discussion. Uh, before we get there, though, um, Angel, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so following up on what. Um, <clears throat> Chris was saying that average core PC was 1.4% since the period when the 2% was um, established, right? And I guess the reason is because 2% was seen as a ceiling and not as a midpoint, de facto. It's not the euro, right? And the reason I'm saying that is that all the projections of the FOMC at the end of the day had inflation converging from below to here, which is the way it's supposed to be if your target is two. But what it does, is that then it becomes a ceiling and not a midpoint. So how can we do 2% better if we don't want to increase the target, right? And one suggestion I've made in the past is that you run inflation close but above 2% during good times under the assumption that in recessions it would be probably falling below two. But you know that or any other suggestion that uh, how, how should monetize, I mean, what is the lesson from that period, right? And obviously the lesson was distorted by the fact that we just got a massive price shock in the middle of it, but hoping that one day we'll go back to a, a more normal steady state, you know, how should we do it in a, in a better way? So flexible average inflation targeting, I think was motivated by some, uh, you know, may well be familiar, everybody may well be familiar with it, but motivated by some theoretical work uh, that was done in say 2016 to 2018, where people essentially showed in a series of papers that if you've got an effective lower bound constraining the interest rate, that uh, in you know reasonable models, you get a bias toward, uh, and, and the central bank tries to hit 2% every period. What happens is when the, uh, when the interest rate is constrained by the effect of lower bound, they don't hit 2%, they go lower than 2%. And so on average, you're gonna undershoot 2% in these models, right? And the way to get out of it in these models is for the central bank to tell uh, the rest of the economy, uh, look, when we hit the effect of lower bound, yes, we're gonna undershoot, uh, we're gonna undershoot 2%, but later, we're gonna let inflation go up above 2%, and we're gonna keep it there a while. And if you do that, then not only th that in fact uh, keeps you from hitting the effective lower bound as often, it basically, it's, it's, uh, it's a self-licking ice cream cone. I mean, it's just, 
it's it's just a, a wonderful tool that not only improves your performance when you hit the effective lower bound, but keeps you away from the effective lower bound. And so, you know, it's really if you, when you if you take these economic models seriously, it's really hard to argue with the flexible average inflation target. I'm sorry, did that answer the question? Or, or I mean, no, it, it does. But then, how do you do it? In practice. Oh, I was going to say your 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 rule, um, the UBDE rule, maybe uh, sounds to me like flexible average inflation target, because you run you run inflation a little higher than two percent in good times, which is comes after bad times, and then. But then my projections say: imagine I were to design the SCP under my rule, inflation. Yeah. Two years out would stay at 2.2 or 2.3 or 2.4 or whatever. It would not have to convert okay. down to two, right? Okay, so that's a little different. James, do you have a, com a thought on the flexible? Uh, well, I, I think one way to frame it is, is for the, the Fed to say what they will fight, right? So at, at 1.7, um, around where we were a lot in core before 19. Um, they would, I mean, you'd have an industrial production slowdown with a perfectly fi fine labor market, and they're fighting deflation with, with rounds of QE. Um, that was odd to me, but there was a certain kind of worldview that got you there. Um, at 2.7% core inflation 12 months from now, will they be fighting it? I don't know. But I, I think how they, I, I think defining it, not in terms of average inflation target, which is a kind of time period over which you calculate an average, which chains you to a certain behavior, or even defining it to a 2% point estimate. Um, what about defining it in terms of, this is the kind of world where we're gonna be adding restriction or we're gonna be adding um, ease. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions here or any kind of wrap up points that the panelists want to want to kind of put across? Any questions? If not, I think that we've got, oh, sorry. Yeah, Michael. So I was just wondering whether it might be worth uh, distinguishing between, you know, good and bad forms of excess inflation. I mean, if we really do transition from commodity and supply chain problems driving inflation to, you know, uh, labor market tightness that drives, uh, you know, inequality towards, uh, you know, historic lows and compresses, you know, some of the spreads there. Do you think your views on, you know, what uh, an acceptable inflation rate is, even if the Fed sticks with a 2% target might shift over time? James? Oh, well, um, I mean, ultimately prices are supposed to be neutral in, in the long run. So you get, you can have a transitory period of, um, of good inflation um, but it really just comes down to your estimate of the potential growth rate of the economy and, and whether you're running above it and whether, therefore, the inflation is something that's going to cost you later. Um, so, um, and, and I mean, there are major uncertainties about the potential growth rate of the economy, like at, at, all, at all times. So, um, so I, unfortunately, I, I don't think there's an easy way to answer your question, and I think this is central to the challenge of, of conducting monetary policy. Chris, taking on the challenge of conducting monetary policy. So demand side inflation. So for instance, the, the, the classic story is that uh, when the economy gets too, and I, I'm speaking very crudely here, when the economy gets too hot, then the Fed takes the punch ball away, right? The reason that that story works or the conditions under which it does work is that the Fed provided the punch, too much punch in the first place. So, you know, demand side inflation is a little bit like um, doing an all nighter binging caffeine to get your work done, right? You're really not doing yourself any good in the long run. It may feel good for a while, but you're not doing yourself any good. Supply side inflation is, is necessarily temporary and self limiting. Doesn't mean we shouldn't react to it at all. If my boss here, President Bullard, were here, he'd be swatting me on the head and reminding me that doesn't mean that we don't react to it at all. But um, it, but it is different than demand side inflation, which is the classic: take the punch bowl away before the party gets started. 
Thank you. In three to four, we have now two more questions. Yeah, I had a. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, we have yeah. one question over here, and then uh, yeah, in ten as well. I'm okay. If we're tight on time, I have a question for Isabella. I'm really curious about your work with, with complementary policy options, um, especially kind of historically speaking, to what degree um, there has been any impact in real economies, if any at all. Um, but if we're tight on time, I'm also happy to just take it up on the spot. Uh, no, we can answer that quickly and then um, <laughs> as quickly as we're able to, and then we can pick up the conversation. We've still got a little bit more time, so that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, kind of related to what James said earlier on um, inflation targeting and that maybe the inflation that we have seen is most similar to the inflation that happened after World War I and World War II. I think that actually these transitions from war to post-war are important um, points of historical reference um, because if we think about the transition from a shutdown to a post-shutdown economy, I think we are basically moving from one regulatory regime for the economy as a whole to another one, where in one situation, the state literally decided who can go to work and who cannot, and which factory can stay open, which cannot, and states around the world have been doing this in an asynchronous kind of fashion. So you did have pretty intense structural shifts. Now, what happened after World War I is that basically they had pretty intense price controls during the World War, right? And then they just pulled all these price, price, con price controls at once, and they got pretty sharp inflation, so an inflationary boom that then um, made a sharp turnaround <laughs> and turned into a deflationary bust. Um, after World War II, American economists, including very conservative economists like Irving Fisher, including the most important textbook economist, um, Paul Samuelson, including uh, the mentor of uh, Milton Friedman, Frank Knight, and so on, were arguing that in this tran transitory moment, um, targeted price controls would be something that could be useful in facilitating this transition because you have a situation where you have bottlenecks, prices shooting up um, without um, a, a supply response because the supply cannot respond because there's a bottleneck. So the price signal basically cannot be operational in, in, in that kind of situation. Um, now, of course, at the time you had price controls and the question was, are you going to lift all price controls or not? Um, so in that sense, you were in a very different world from the world that we are living in today, right? Where obviously we do not have price controls for most things. And the question would be, are you imposing price controls? I think that price controls generally um, can only ever buy time. So if you are in an extreme situation of an extreme supply shock where prices inevitably are going to explode in ways where you do not get a supply response, and you are talking about something very important, you are not talking about the price shock in canoes in Western Massachusetts where I was living, but you are talking about the price shock in gas and oil, or you are talking about the block port of LA that became the bottleneck of the bottlenecks <laughs> for an import dependent economy like the US, right? Then I think we can think about whether temporary constraints to the to the degree at which prices can increase, so not a fixed price ceiling, but the degree by which prices can increase. Um, can be useful, which is basically what the price gouging laws are already doing at the state level for natural emergencies. Um, and um, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying this is like the magic weapon that you should pull at every moment, but in these situations of extreme shocks, um, of extreme supply constraints, I think they can play some role. But they will, of course, only be as good as the time that you have bought um, will be used if you are kind of buying time and then you're doing nothing about the um, about correcting the supply shock that you have, then when you lift the uh, price <laughs> um, uh, uh, constraint, uh, you will be in the same situation as before, and then prices will just shoot up a little bit later, right? Um, but I think this is one of the lessons that we can take from the debates that the most important economists in the U.S. had at this moment of transition. I think that if we look at China and we look at how China has, for example, been handling the grain price shock, then they have a gigantic reserve system, right, which is probably larger than any <laughs> rich country would want to maintain. Um, I'm not saying that all of Europe and the U.S. should be running these gigantic reserves. Um, I think that would be absurd and would probably add to the grain price pressures. But thinking about um, possibilities where buffer stock could interact with markets in the sense of sending signals to markets using market signaling via um, these kind of uh, market participatory 
tools, I think it's something that one can think about. I'm not saying it will immediately work. It's definitely very complicated. We also have many cases where these kind of policy tools did not work well, but I think it's something that we should be studying as we are trying to think about ways to um, buffer um, the, 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 the kind of um, shocks that I think are unfortunately likely to reoccur. Thank you. Nathan, we have. Yeah, I had a, a quick question. Love to get your thoughts on, on the role of technology. We live in an interesting time now, with EV space, definitely AI, uh, blockchain, uh, quantum that's emerging. It has direct impact on both labor and productivity. So love to get your thoughts of how do you include that in this in this conversation? Because it has a massive impact on what we're doing, both in terms of, again, availability of labor, AI already has sort of you know, driven that whole movement in terms of especially knowledge workers, which are GBT and everything else that's 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 coming in, in, into the space. I'll, I'll pause here and get your thoughts. Christopher is coming into your thinking. Sure. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of factors that, that can potentially affect prices, you know, technology, demographics, uh, a lot of different factors. The only thing, ultimately, what's going to govern inflation though is monetary policy not necessarily in the short run in the short run certainly you can have supply factors you can have supply shocks wars things like that covid but in the longer run um you know ai is going to be good if it helps us produce more goods and services uh other things you know like that other improving technologies they're good because they help us produce more goods and services but they're not really going to affect inflation because any central bank can take those into account when it formulates monetary policy. And so the central bank can still determine the, the long run rate of inflation. Thank you, James. Yeah, well, I, I think um, it creates uncertainty about models. I think that that can be true, what we just heard, but it can also be true that uh, if you couldn't trust the potential growth estimate before, now you really can't trust the potential growth rate. You know, we, we heard earlier uh, from the president about, um, you know, do we think our statistics are capturing these effects? Do we think our productivity measurements are good? Um, these issues are getting more severe rather than less with these new technologies. I think the thing that's very salient, though, about these um, is, is really on the relative price side. I don't feel like I've got relative prices and pure monetary policy, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sitting in the middle. And um, you know, one of the interesting things about ChatGPT is we're coming out of decades where all of the shocks seem to be negative shocks of demand for, for lower skilled labor and positive shocks of demand for higher skilled labor. And you had a steepening of the labor income distribution related to that. And it feels like now technology may be about to start to do the opposite, which is really interesting and really important. I'm not so sure it's a monetary policy issue in the pure sense, um, but I, I, I actually, I think it probably will be somehow because I think it's it's very important and we all need to think a lot about it. Thank you very much. And we will come to a close now because I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank you all for your questions, especially the ones that came in right at the end. We'll try and uh, moderate that into the next session with Mark, which I'm very pleased to have um, with uh, Fabio looking around tackling financial stability questions. So actually, I think a lot of what we've just spoken about towards the end there feeds very nicely into the challenges we currently see ourselves in. So thank you. <laughs>